Everybody needs money. That's why they call it money. The best things in life are free. But you can give them to the birds and bees. I need From Fool Global Headquarters, this is Motley Fool Money. It's the Motley Fool Money Radio Show. I'm Chris Hill. Joining me this week, Jason Moser and Ron Gross. Good to see you as always, gentlemen. Hey, hey. Chris. We've got the latest headlines from Wall Street. We will preview next week's events from Apple and Amazon. And as always, we've got a couple of stocks on our radar. But we begin with the week in entertainment where the overall business landscape had a rough week. Movie theater stocks down across the board after Cineworld Group, the second largest chain in the world, announced it is closing all of its theaters in the U.S. and the U.K., Broadway extended its shutdown through the end of May 2021. And AT&T is on the verge of selling DirecTV for 70% less than it paid for it just five years ago. Jason Moser, I'll start with you. I guess the silver lining in traditional entertainment continues to be the streaming services. We saw Netflix and Roku both up this week after getting upgrades from Wall Street analysts, but that's really just a silver lining. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely not a lot to yeah, not a lot to smile about here. I mean, you're talking about 97,000 workers who rely on Broadway for their livelihood. You're talking about 45,000 people um, in, in, impacted by the Cineworld closures. Um, I mean, that is that's a lot of employment. That is a lot of of, uh, of money. That that is a lot of economic output uh, that that is just going to essentially disappear. And we don't know really when it's going to come back. Um, it, the really the, the weird thing about the entertainment industry right now, and, and we talked about this earlier in the week. You know, they they've got a supply problem and a demand problem. I mean, you don't have consumers frequenting the theaters or uh, Broadway for obvious reasons. Most most everything is shut down. But even for areas that are not closed, for theaters that are still open, it's just the demand isn't there, right? Consumers aren't just clamoring to get out there um, and sit in crowded spaces. And, and by the same token, you've also got Hollywood and, and all of the producers and actors, they're faced with not being able to really supply the entertainment to begin with. And, and so in most cases, uh, you're, you're seeing sort of this one-two punch in the entertainment industry. And there are a couple of, of outliers there. They're able to deal with this a little bit uh, better than others. I mean, we've seen Disney obviously uh, able to utilize Disney Plus as a platform to get that content out there. And typically, when you have you know, highly produced or animated content. It's not necessarily the same supply problem that you might witness with with uh, real life uh, production. Uh, but but regardless, I mean, this is it. This is an industry that has been thrown into chaos, and it touches so many lives. There's so many participants in the value chain. Um, it, it, it's going to be a while. I mean, Broadway now is going to be closed through May of 2021. That is that's 15 billion dollars of annual economic impact to the city of New York. I mean, that's just, that's a tremendous amount of money. And then top it all off with uh, politicians in D.C. who just cannot come together to provide some level of assistance for the folks that need it most. It's just a very frustrating time for a lot of folks, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, most of us don't get to a Broadway show very often, but the the movie business, right, it's a, it's a part of our you know, some some of us are weekly or if not weekly, monthly kind of social activities. And it's not just consumers' apprehension to get back into a crowded space. As you mentioned, Jason, there's not a lot of blockbuster movies out there. And those that have been produced have been postponed, like a Wonder Woman, for example. When the vaccine comes, I think production gets back in gear. And then it's a question of do consumers then feel comfortable getting back into a crowded space sitting next to their neighbor um, and going back to the movies. But with all the wonderful streaming services we have and all the first release movies coming on streaming, it's not as important as it once was. Shares of IBM up this week after the company announced it is spinning off its IT infrastructure division into a new publicly traded company. The deal is expected to close by the end of 2021. Ron, Arvind Krishna has only been CEO for a few months. You think right. this is a good move? I, I do think it's a smart move to unlock the value of the cloud business. It's a quintessential move when you have a slow growth, low margin business combined with a faster growth, large opportunity business. 
from a stock market perspective, if you separate those two, the faster growth, larger opportunity business should receive a valuation that is more appropriate. And uh, when, if you don't separate them, what happens is the valuation gets dragged down as a result of the slower business. So that managed infrastructure service, which is the services business, which is the, the less exciting one, will be the new company. It'll have about 19 billion in revenue, so not a small company, 25,000 employees, uh, 90,000 employees, I should say. That's about 25% of the total of IBM right now. So the larger piece will be f uh, focused on cloud. Um, they'll be able to focus now on the hybrid cloud business, the artificial intelligence business, which was all acquired in that $33 billion Red Hat acquisition in 2019 uh, last year. So th that opportunity is gonna be really exciting. And then the question is, instead of trading at nine or 10 times earnings, which is where IBM was before this announcement, does that cloud business get something more like a Microsoft valuation? 30 times, you know, 32 times, uh, likely, uh, certainly higher than 10. Will it approach something like a Microsoft? Remains to be seen, but I do believe it, it will unlock significant value. Advanced micro devices in the spotlight on Friday on reports that AMD is in final talks to buy specialty chip maker Xilinx. Jason, AMD could be paying up to $30 billion for Xilinx. You think this is a good deal? Um, I, I definitely think it could make sense. I mean, AMD is is certainly in a heated competition with other big companies in the space like Intel. Uh, you've got NVIDIA buying ARM holdings. I mean, this would be a big acquisition for sure, but I mean, they can finance it easily, uh, finance it easily via debt uh, or shares or a combination of both. I mean, shares are pretty cheap currency today. Uh, so, so I suspect that, you know, from a financial perspective, it's, it's, it, it would be an easy pill for them to swallow. Um, I, I mean, AMD and all of these chip companies are really seeing uh, some, some push up in demand as, as this you know digital pandemic economy uh, continues to, uh, to to take front and center and I think you know in regard to xilinx uh, xilinx their forte they make special they make these they make these programmable logic devices right these things called PLDs are essentially programmable chips as opposed to specialized chips so they're typically you can make these more quickly they're more flexible they're faster to market than custom silicon chips that a lot of these companies make and it, it's important I think to remember too who their customers are it's not just data centers now with that said management for xilinx Xilinx made it very clear it is pursuing a data center first strategy to growth, and that's why their data center segment is the fastest growing. It is a big opportunity that we're seeing a lot of companies, including uh, Nvidia, for example, pursuing. Um, but but all in all, I mean, they have a nice diverse com customer base from industrial to wired and wireless automotive broadcast data centers, of course. Um, we're seeing consolidation in the space, no doubt about it. Scale is a big competitive advantage when it comes to making and designing and implementing these chips. Uh, so I, I could see a world where Xilinx and AMD together uh, makes sense. Well, and if this deal goes through from a market cap standpoint, AMD is probably going to be roughly half the size of Intel, Yeah. which if you go back a decade, Intel was 10 times the size, 20 times the size of AMD. It's, it's sure. really remarkable the run that company has had, particularly over the last five years. Yeah, and I mean, when you consider Intel not really capitalizing, so to speak, on the mobile front, um, it, it that that market cap could have been really a lot greater even than it is today. Amazon and Apple both have big events next week. So which one is under more pressure to make sure it goes well? We're going to talk about that and more after the break, so stay right here. You're listening to Motley Fool Money. Welcome back to Motley Fool Money. Chris Hill here with Jason Moser and Ron Gross. Third quarter revenue for Domino's Pizza came in higher than expected. Same store sales were strong, but shares of Domino's down nearly 10% this week. This is a good quarter, Ron, but their costs are rising. Costs are rising, but it's largely pandemic-related, employee bonus-related. Now, commodity costs also are up 3.8% because, for some reason, the price of cheese hit an all-time high <laughs> during the quarter, and that you know is actually a very, very large input cost for Domino's. 
Um, so, you know, they did not meet profit expectations despite incredible demand for, for their products um, and really great top line numbers. As you said, same store sales growth in the U.S. up 17.5%. I mean, that, that alone beat estimates. That's an incredible number, obviously juiced by, by the pandemic and, and, and everyone ordering um, to their homes. International up 6.2%. These, these are incredible numbers, 107 consecutive quarters of international same-store sales growth and 38 consecutive quarters of U.S. same-store sales growth. I remember back in the day when we were talking about these guys revamping their menu and wondering where they were going to go. Uh, they've done a wonderful job. They continue to focus on tech innovations. Uh, they added wings, chicken tacos, and cheeseburgers to their menu. I'm not getting a cheeseburger from Domino's, but listen, if that's your thing... Go for it. Wait, 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 um, wait, wait, wait. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me clear this up. Isn't that a cheeseburger or a chicken taco? It's a cheeseburger pizza. Pizza, right? Yes. Okay, so it's not the actual burger. Yeah, but I, that, I don't. Like, that's a big thing in Massachusetts where I went to school. Cheeseburger pizzas. I never, never. It's not my thing. Yeah. No. Um, but again, strong. Seventeen point nine percent increase in total revenue. Uh, Eighty three um, net store growth. So they're continuing to open up stores. As we said, the higher costs, though pandemic related, employee bonus related, commodity related, did hurt margins. Uh, but listen, earnings per share were still up twenty one percent. That's a great number. The problem with the stock is that when you're trading at thirty two times, if if you meet miss profit expectations and you don't get growth anywhere near 25 30 percent you're going to get a bit of a sell-off in the stock but still a wonderful job by these guys you know jason you look at the numbers out of domino's um mcdonald's came out this week with really impressive same store sales numbers for september and at the other end of the spectrum you get these sit down restaurants that just continue to struggle ruby tuesday uh, declaring bankruptcy this week and uh, it seems like the longer this pandemic goes on, the more we're going to see this fork in the road where fast food and fast casual restaurants like Chipotle have a greater opportunity and the Applebee's and TGI Fridays of the world just become more and more challenged. Yeah, and I mean, I don't mean to draw quite the comparison here, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. I mean, it's <laughs> like these businesses that were built on cloud native infrastructure, right? I mean, that is a much different uh, ball of wax. I mean, something like a Zoom versus a Skype, right? We say Zoom's big advantage, one of its big advantages was that it, it's cloud native right? versus something like a Skype, which wasn't necessarily that case. These these restaurants, I mean, it's it's the easier the pivot they have to make during times like these, the more successful they're going to be. So whether it's a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A or a Domino's or, or a Chipotle, I mean, these were businesses that made investments in, in mobile and delivery and, 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 and a good experience long ago. And, and you could certainly question long ago whether those investments were really worth it. Clearly now we're seeing that they were worth it. And you couple that along with their scale. I mean, it's just a much more efficient way to spread costs, to keep things consistent. It just really is a matter of when we get the, the economy back open and people want to actually go sit in a restaurant, much like the entertainment industry is today. Yeah, and I would like to add that it is National Pizza Month. Go out there, support your local pizzeria. Domino's and, and Papa John's will be okay for a few weeks. Go out there and support your local guy in the corner. Hey, and support your local chef at your house. You got somebody at your house that likes to cook? Buy him a pizza stone and a peel. I got that, and it's nice. a wonderful gift. Shares of Alteryx up 35% this week. The data analytics software company increased revenue guidance for the third quarter. 35%, Jason. How much did they boost that guidance? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> um, I, I think this is a great example of, of where sometimes, you know, when it looks like the chips are down, investing ultimately, it's about patience. It's not about perfection. We're not trying to hit home runs every time. Sometimes the market just doesn't operate on our timeline. Um, but but back to your point there in regard to guidance, it was just a few months ago where they did, you know, they, they, they offered up guidance that really didn't meet expectations. Um, fast forward a couple of months, they're able to boost that guidance a little bit. It, it was modest, but it was enough. Like I said, I mean, that ranged from $111 million to $115 million. Now they've boosted it to a, a range of $126 to $128 million. Um, you couple that along with a leadership change. The the co-founder of the business, the CEO, uh, Dean Stecker, is going to step down as CEO. He's going to move over to executive chairman. Uh, succeeding him is Mark Anderson. Uh, he's, he's a seasoned vet of, of the industry, formerly at Palo, Palo Alto Networks. Uh, so, so clearly very familiar uh, with this line of work. And, and I think 
perhaps the bigger question is folks think, how, how could that change so quickly in such a short period of time? I think that's a very valid question, but you have to remember with a business like Alteryx, uh, it, it's similar to a business like DocuSign. When they're reporting billings as a metric of success, a metric that matters, billings can be very squishy and very timing related. And, and, and you add that to the fact that right now, I mean, things are just all up in the air regarding COVID-19. It makes it makes projecting these these numbers far more difficult than, than it would be in normal times. It's not uncommon, but it it was nice to see that they were able to get out there, uh, boost those numbers up a little bit. The succession is now that add out of the way. They don't have to worry about that question anymore. Um, so it does sound like Alteryx is setting themselves up for success and, and uh, like, like, like the direction that they're headed. This week, Costco said same-store sales in the month of September rose 15.5%. Costco's next earnings report isn't due for another two months. But, Ron, comps like that, that's got to give investors something to look forward to. Strong numbers, um, Costco being one of the retail winners during during the pandemic alongside Amazon uh, and Walmart and Target. 14.5% uh, increase in comps in the U.S., 17 and a half in Canada. E-commerce up a whopping 90%. You know, th these are big numbers that, that won't be sustainable, but for now, they're doing a, d doing a really wonderful job. They did get a boost. Uh, two holidays kind of were shifted into the month of September, uh, Labor Day in the U.S., Moon Festival in Asia, interestingly. Um, so that, that gave them a little bit of a boost, but still incredible numbers. Um, shares are up 25% this year. Stock is not cheap, hasn't been cheap for quite a while. You're paying a premium for this great company. You're paying like 38 times earnings. That, that's versus like a Walmart where you can get for 26 times or a Target you can get for 22 times or even a BJ's 17 times. I would argue that Costco is a really well-run company and it deserves a premium, but you got to be careful because it's, it's getting kind of pricey. Tuesday, October 13th is going to be a busy day. Apple is holding an event to unveil the iPhone 12 along with updated versions of other devices. The 13th is also the start of Amazon's Prime Day event, which is usually held in July. Jason, obviously both companies want the day to go well. Which one needs it more? Well, I mean, I, I think Amazon needs it more. I think Apple. We've already Apple's already kind of set the set the table for us, right? With the the event they had um, a few weeks back with the tablets and Macs and, and watch, uh, not quite ready to release that phone yet but but we knew that it was coming and and so I think they're very excited to get this this 5G enabled phone out there uh, I think consumers are just champing at the bit for an upgrade. I think it's perfect timing as far as the holiday season upcoming. And and we know that supply likely shouldn't be an issue because Apple's been planning for this and, and, and are gearing up for around 75 million iPhones to, to, to initially get this thing rolling. Amazon, I, I think that ever since the pandemic really started, the big question with Amazon, and we've seen some weakness, some, some uh, cracks there, in the foundation regarded, uh, regarding of fulfillment, right? Shipping and logistics, it's just not necessarily been as seamless as it has been before. Part of that is due to conditions on the ground, but I think also part of that is due to competition entering the fray. And we're seeing a lot of success from companies like Wayfair and Chewy, uh, uh, Etsy, for, for example, that they're certainly uh, following that Amazon blueprint to a degree. What do you think, Ron? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, Amazon, it's their business, the fulfillment, right? So if, if they if they mess that up, their business is in serious jeopardy. It'll be interesting to see, is this actually the launch of the holiday season, the early launch of the holiday season, and it will be a test run to see how they do. Apple, on the other hand, needs to continue to be innovative forever, not just stick to their knitting and do what they do. Um, so it's always important every year to see what Apple has has out next, whether it's the iPhone 12 or the over-the-air uh, head AirPods. Um, but I I think Amazon's got something to prove here with terms of fulfillment. Make it go smoothly, and, and people will continue to kind of click, do their shopping uh, right on that site. All right, guys, we'll see you later in the show. Up next, a conversation with Roger Martin about why businesses shouldn't focus too much on any single metric. Stay right here. This is Motley Fool Money. Welcome back to Motley Fool Money. I'm Chris Hill. What is the highest purpose of a business? That's just one of the questions Motley Fool senior analyst Bill Mann posed last week to author Roger Martin. They talked about Costco, why it's bad for businesses to focus on any single metric, as well as Roger Martin's newest book. Your newest book, which is called When More is Not Better, Overcoming America's Obsession with the with economic efficiency came out 
just this last month, correct? It's uh, been just very two days ago. Two, two days, days ago, ago, which was last yeah. month. So yeah, I, I, good gonna, point. Good point. I'm going to say on a technicality that I'm on it. Did you? So we have been talking in the Motley Fool Live con, uh, um, uh, construct. We've been talking since March, and then even before that, about the danger that has in the fragility that has been that has been introduced into American businesses by being so focused on shareholder capitalism. Yeah, and. What we've seen in 2020, look at the airline industry, look at the oil and gas industry, is the fact that they didn't have the capital resources because they were so focused on this that they were fragile at a very bad time. I'm wondering, did you, did, was this the impetus for beginning the book or was this something, is this a process that you have been thinking about for a much longer period of time? No, it's actually something I've been thinking about for a long period of time. I started the work in 2013 and actually put it to bed, send it off, send it off for the final editing and publishing uh, in January before, before uh, COVID. So this was not a response to COVID, but in some sense, it, it, uh, I, I guess I think I, I had it more right than wrong on, on the notion that, that uh, our pursuit of efficiency. And, and, and I, think, I think this whole, your, your, the theme you've just talked about, the shareholder value mac- maximization pursuit of that, is a subset of a broader, okay. broader phenomenon. It's kind of in some sense even worse than you just des- you describe, uh, or more. Because I feel pessimistic positive. about this. So, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but that that we that we have uh, a privileged uh, efficiency over resilience to such an extent that we have we have created some problems that that we didn't anticipate. And I did not realize that you know within a month after I uh, you know put the book to bed that would be visited on us, which it, which it mm. certainly was in, uh, in uh, COVID. But this, this whole, there's one thing to pursue, whether it's shareholder value maximization or actually almost anything else. If you just say it's one thing, that will make you kind of extreme and, and, uh, and fragile. And it turns out that shareholder value uh, maximization and pursuit of that, that most certainly has. We are here at The Motley Fool, and we are investors who write for other investors. So we are tautologically shareholders. Yes. What is it that, you view, that, that, that your research tells you about this single-mindedness is bad? Um, it's, it's bad because attempting to produce that does not lead to it. Right, this goes all the way back to the, maybe one of the wisest men uh, in history, uh, Aristotle, who pointed out 2,400 years ago uh, that if a man sets out to seek to be happy, he's unlikely to end up happy. If instead he seeks to live a good life, by which he meant live a life of like servitude to, uh, to his to society, his fellow man, et cetera, et cetera. He's likely to end up happy. I say the same thing about, about shareholder value maximization. The idea that you're attempting to do that and saying to everybody involved, that's what I'm attempting to do, is not correlated in any way with doing it. And in fact, it makes the job harder. I like the J&J approach. You know, when Robert Wood Johnson took J&J public in 1948, uh, he, he created a credo that's in, engraved in granite, and I'll paraphrase it, but it said, patients, which were their customers, patients come first, employees come second, the communities in which we uh, uh, work come third and last, not next, last, come shareholders. However, if we do a good job in the first three, shareholders will earn a fair return. Well, with Johnson & Johnson worth several hundred billion dollars now, they've done just fine, even though he says they're last. So, so the idea of saying something is first will not necessarily happen unless there's a system that, that produces that. And Robert Wood Johnson had a system. He said, take care of these three people and, and, and uh, the, uh, the shareholder value thing will take care of itself. So that's why, so there is no evidence to suggest that since shareholder value became the, the thing of primacy, sort of arising out of Mike Jensen's uh, kind of famous article in 1976, shareholders haven't done better. No, managers have done well. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And you think, no, 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 that's not the way, that, that's not the way that we align their interest with shareholders with stock-based compensation. This is, this is all supposed to work well, but no, it turns out, it turns out that that doesn't improve uh, kind of shareholder value. In fact, as I've written in several, several other artic articles and, and a book, uh, stock-based compensation actually puts shareholders and managers uh, in opposition uh, to one another. Uh, yeah. So, so it's this, these simplistic things in, in a very, you know, in a very complicated world, and I don't want to overstate it, but in a, in, a, in a complicated world, you just can't have those singular objective functions. That's why Robert Wood Johnson was smart. Southwest Airlines is smart. They say, here's what we want. We want to be the lowest cost, highest customer satisfaction, highest employee satisfaction, and most profitable airline. And you'd say, you got to be kidding me. Those are like internally inconsistent, contradictory. How the heck do you get to be low cost and having high employee satisfaction? The answer is in one word, cleverness. You've got to find a clever way to, to balance the, the, those uh, uh, things out. So they say, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to simplify the system so that we can actually have fewer employees per passenger seat mile, uh, not because we work them harder. Uh, yes, they work on a variety of things, but we simplify the things so that we can pay them more than anybody else. So they're deliriously happy to work for us, which will make customers uh, uh, happier. It'll make each other happy because they all come to work uh, kind of happier than at the other airlines. So that it, it, it's a complex world, mm. right? That requires you to have some more complexity in the way you think about uh, uh, how to uh, how to manage it. Not these simplistic, you know. Well, all we have to do is say, uh, kind of, we want to maximize shareholder value. Doesn't work. You have hit upon two of the three companies that I specifically wanted to bring up during this half hour that we spend with you. Oh, really? I wanted, yes. I wanted to talk about Johnson & Johnson and specifically their reaction to the Tylenol, uh, the, the Tylenol, it's not a scandal, I'm not pulling the, 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 the right word, the, you know, the crisis, disaster, yeah, crisis. disaster yep. Yep. in 1981 in which they – they, they, they pulled no punches. They had a plan in place and it was, it was expensive for them. Yes. I think, it, wasn't say, it $300 million in, in immediate costs of taking all the Tylenol off, off the shelves? I yeah. think in 1981 dollars, $300 million. Just, that's in cost. That's not even opportunity yeah. cost. That's cost. Yep. Yep. And that happened, you know, and, and, and uh, it, you know, and is going, th you know, going through your book, you seem to, you seem to claim that about the break point from when we went, to, you know, where we really started pushing to, you know, a primacy of shareholder capitalism, about 1976, you know, not to put too po fine of a point on it, would, if you were to re-extrapolate, was J and J's response in the early 1980s the same type of response that you would have expected to see from a company in 2018, where that singular focus was much more in place. Yeah, no. If with the singular focus in place, I, I, I would have expected them to say, "Well, we got to be careful here. We got to not take any steps that would cost us, you know, kind of too much uh, money in this quarter." Uh, right. That. that that's that's what would have been the case, and and uh, they'd have taken whatever the hit was to the reputation of the of the product, right? In this case, the you know as history has shown the extremeness of their res re response. We're going to take it all off the shelves, and we're going to go to all these lengths. We're gonna we're gonna create three layers of of se protective seals and everything. Everybody sort of said, "Wow, is yeah. Tylenol ever safe?" Whereas right. they would have left it on the shelves and said, well, just be a little careful. If it tastes a little funny, maybe you shouldn't swallow it. You know, That's right. Have, <laughs> if you swallow it and it was bad, don't swallow it. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Some really helpful, helpful advice. You know, it, we probably wouldn't, we, we would probably rec hardly recognize the Tylenol brand because it would be gone, right? It would yeah. be one of those, those uh, crippled uh, brands, maybe, uh, maybe uh, limping along. So, so yeah, I think, I mean, that's 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 just the problem, and and you know, as I I, I always when I'm talking about this to challenge people, I say, well, do, do you do you operate with a single objective function in 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 your life? It's all about my work. Yeah. 
No, it, it's, oh, I have, to, I have to balance these things. I want to do what I need to do to you know, get ahead and have a good career, but also you know, take care of my family and, and, and my home life and, and you know, you know, my whatever aging parents and whatever. You, you have to balance these things. So why is it notionally that companies can't? Right? That was the argument that Milton Friedman in 1970 and Mike Jensen uh, later, later on 76 and uh, some other ar ar articles said, you have to have one objective function or everything will go, uh, go to pot. Uh, cats and dogs sleeping together, you know, it, it's going to be a day. It's, it's, it's going to be chaos. chaos. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm sort of thinking like, uh, gee, uh, so every individual in the world has to do that balance a bunch of a, a bunch of things to live a, live a decent life why is it that individuals can and this entity called a corporation for sure can it would be imp impossible and and it's just it but it ruled the day it, it absolutely ruled the day the notion that that is what if you're a good strong manager you will have a single objective function and you will focus everything on that and then like when people do extreme things in service of that People are like, oh, why did that happen? Well, it's, be it's because the message was clear. <laughs> Do extreme amounts of that, of that thing. More is always better. No, it's not. More is sometimes yeah. uh, kind of not better. Roger, what do you think is the, uh, I I is the highest purpose of business? I think it's uh, to make a buck while making the world a better place. Right? So uh, it's to earn, you know, uh, a return for shareholders that make shareholders say, I'm glad I gave the company the, the, the money and the bond, bondholders, by the way, all capital providers, I'm glad right. I gave them the money. Uh, and and uh, the people in the company can say, let's say 10 years later, you know, the world is better in the following uh, way. They have a product or service that makes their lives better that they didn't have 10 years ago and we didn't wreck the economy to do it. Uh, we created jobs uh, that that are above the living wage, uh, so that uh, whoever was the the worker, whether there's a husband, the wife, they could help you know pay for their children's education to better them. So it's that kind. Again, it's two things. It's you have to make a buck and make the world uh, a better place. Yeah, as I you know as I've going as I've gone through your writings and as as I've gone through this book, the the company that I kept coming back to and it's a, and it's a it's a stock that I've held since the '90s and very happily so is Costco. Ah, uh, oh, good Jim, for you. Uh, Jim oh boy, Senegal, you made a lot of money. Uh, right, but I've I've made I I've done very well in every single quarter. With Jim Senegal, uh, you know, w would get on for the quarterly call and the Wall Street analyst would say, you know, if you just raised your prices a little bit more and, you know, if you just were to adopt the median wage and, uh, you know, if you were just to do these things, you would make so much more money. Yeah. And yet, to me, in some ways, Costco, I mean, you know, I've, I've benefited quite happily from it, but to me, that model is an enlightened model for capitalism. Absolutely. And right. And, and, and so for the people who are like worried about, Oh, you're too socially conscious. You're not going to make money. It's made a, a, t a ton of money for you. If you say, Oh no, but maybe in uncom less competitive businesses, discount retailing is not competitive. Last time I checked, it's fiercely, fiercely competitive. So in the, in one of the most fiercely competitive industries in all of America, this company is minting money by by being more sophisticated about the system and the yeah. system they, you know, Jim Senegal would, would say, you know, I need to have my employees feel rested, healthy, not worrying about making ends, uh, ends meet at home when they deal with the customer, because then they'll give the customer their attention. They'll be upbeat with the, with the customer. The customer will love it. The customer will love that, uh, that experience. And that's why I'm going to pay them 20 plus dollars an hour when, when the you know, laws and the labor market for, for jobs in retail says, you know, 12, 13, 14 would, would, be, would be plenty. I mean, that's, that's just an irrelevance uh, 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 to him. He, they, they couldn't care less what the minimum wa wage is right. because it's not, it's not relevant to their, uh, uh, to their business. That kind, of, that kind of broad based thinking about how to create value is, is I think a thing of rare beauty and he's, and he's magnificent. The book is When More Is Not Better, 
overcoming America's obsession with economic efficiency. Don't touch that dial. Ron Gross and Jason Moser are coming back with a couple of stock ideas for your watch list. Stay right here. You're listening to Motley Fool Money. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. Welcome back to Motley Fool Money. Chris Hill here once again with Jason Moser and Ron Gross. Guys, with the holidays coming up, it is never too early to think about what to get that special investor in your life. Go to shop.fool.com for best-selling items like Motley Fool hats, shirts, fleece, full zip sweaters, and more. That's shop.fool.com. It is the only place in the world you can buy the official Motley Fool Money mug. Let's get to the stocks on our radar. Our man behind the glass, Steve Roido, is back. He's going to hit you with a question. Ron Gross, you are up first. What are you looking at? How about we go to Equinix, E-Q-I-X, largest global operator of data centers, over 200 centers around the world. Interestingly, it's organized as a real estate investment trust. It's a recent David Gardner uh, recommendation, a two-time rack in our total income service. Uh, they continue to capitalize on growing data consumption, increased cloud outsourcing, growing device counts um, that we all have. Uh, data centers are very difficult to replicate, giving them a, a very strong competitive advantage. Revenue model, real strong. 95% of revenue is recurring, about 80% of bookings uh, from existing customers, 70 consecutive quarters of revenue growth, 1.3% yield. The REIT structure will, will probably keep that growing over time. Uh, Steve, question about Equinix? How would I know a good data center from a bad one? Um, and I, I, I ask that because uh, I'm assuming all data centers probably, the, they don't lose data, right? There's, there's, <laughs> that's the thing. They can't lose the data. So if they're all keeping the data, isn't it just a, isn't it just a who's the cheapest provider? It's uh, just like real estate, location, location, location. You want them spread out. You want them in key centers. It costs money to build these things. So location is key. Jason Moser, what are you looking at this week? Yeah, speaking of location, 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 um, I'm, I'm diving into EXP World Holdings. Uh, ticker is EXPI, and uh, my man Matt Frankel and I uh, dug into this company on Monday's Industry Focus this past week. And the main part of the business is EXP Realty. It's essentially cloud-based real estate brokerage services uh, for residential homeowners and home buyers. Uh, so we certainly know that that real estate is moving online. It does uh, feel like it has been slow to disrupt, but it is happening uh, nonetheless. And the numbers that uh, EXP continues to lob up, they're pretty impressive. Uh, if you look at the number of agents and brokers on the platform, that grew from 20,162 a year ago to 31,091 at the end of the second quarter in 2020. And uh, the, the residential transaction volume closed for the second quarter of, to, of 2020 increased 26% to $13 billion. So, uh, you we're seeing companies like Redfin and Zillow moving in all of this direction. EXP is a smaller company playing in the same sandbox. Uh, Glenn Sanford, CEO, uh, founder of the business, owns 30% of the company. His ex-wife actually owns the other 20%. So, some interesting uh, dynamics at play there. But, uh, yeah, there's even an, an interesting immersive technology angle here, too. So, one I've got on my radar. Steve? Do traditional realtors want to embrace tools like this? No, and I think that's why it's been so slow to develop. It is taking money out of their pockets. What do you want to add to your watch list, Steve? I think EXP. I think it nice. sounds interesting. Hey, All right, Jason Moser, Ron Gross, guys, thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. That's going to do it for this week's edition of Motley Fool Money. The show is mixed by Steve Broido. Our producer is Matt Greer. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.